this is now the second episode of our brief series about the family called Against the Tide. And I, I think it was thoroughly uh, explained last Sunday by Pastor Marty what we mean by against the tide, because there's a tide of ungodly influence that's just overtaking our families, uh, influence from media or the wrong crowd, or even our own deceitful hearts, and certainly the attacks of Satan. But the subtitle says, how Christ anchored families make a difference. And so while we have stated in a way the problem, which is the tide, the, un, the tide of ungodliness, we also want to look at the solution, and that is anchoring our families in Christ. And when our families are anchored in Christ, not only are we a blessing to each other, but we can be a blessing to many other people, even to the rest of the world because we're beginning on a biblical premise and that is that God designed, originally designed the family to be a blessing. Again, not just to the members, you know, to each other, but to be a blessing even to the people around us. But I do realize that for a great many of our family situations, we're experiencing and facing different degrees of challenges marital relationships, relationships between parents and children, or even among siblings, or a combination of all of these things. And some of the situations we're facing can be very dark, very deep. They've run up for a long time. And sometimes we think, is there really hope for our family? But this afternoon, we want to tell you, we want to tell ourselves that our God and His Word among many other things, our God is a God of hope. And His Word is a word of hope. How many of you need hope today in your families? Welcome to the club. Thank you for your honesty. God honors a humble heart. And so let's journey through this message together. But before we get into the message per se, let's uh, have a little fun, okay? Let's start out by playing Name That Family. Are you ready? I'll show you pictures of three families. You need to shout out the name of the family. Are you game? Okay, let's go. Let's start with this one. What is the name of this family? This one, who are they? The who? The Von Tra Okay, how, how come this section always knows the answer? There must be a common denominator <laughs> among the people seated here. Okay, the Von Trapp family, the... the the movie is what? Sound of Music. Okay, this next one already, they said it. Who is this? The movie is? Okay, in the earlier service, they asked, what family is this? The Godfather. That's not their name. That was the name of the movie. So it is the Corleone family. Now, this last one, if you don't know the answer, you've been living on some other planet, okay? What family is this? Ah, you all know them? You all know them. Do you know their names? Okay. So this is Mr. Incredible. That's kind of easy to figure out. And this lady is who? Very good. Not Mrs. Incredible. Elastic Girl. And this young lady is? Huh? Violet, right? And this young man is? You know, I'm hearing younger and smaller voices. And the most famous of all? Jack-Jack, Jack, Jack, exactly. Why am I showing you the Incredibles? Couple of reasons. One is, sometimes we're able to see and hear a few families and when we look at them we say, that family is really incredible. And in the depths of our hearts we're asking ourselves, Will our family ever be like that? Can my family ever be like that? They seem to have it all together. But you know what? Just going back to this fictitious family, did they really have it all together? Or did they have their issues too? Oh, they had their issues. Certainly, they had their issues. And yet, they're still the incredible family. Well, again, I want us to realize today that 
God uses families in incredible ways because he's able to transform families in incredible ways. For your family and mine, there's hope. There's hope for transformation, there's hope for healing, and there is hope to be used to be a blessing, again, not just to one another, but to the people around us. Maybe you'd reach even farther than we could ever think or ask or imagine. Our God is a God of hope. Let me show you uh, an actual illustration from nature about what it means to go against the tide and why it's important. These are salmon swimming upstream. It's sometimes called the salmon run. Why do salmon swim upstream? They have, there's one reason and one simple reason alone, and that is to preserve their offspring. You see, salmon are born in fresh water, in uh, lakes and rivers, but when they grow up a bit, they find their way out to the open sea or the ocean. But when it's time to lay their eggs and fertilize their young, they make that trip swimming upstream like their life depended on it because it does. You see, if they don't go back to the place where they were born to now breed the next generation, if they don't swim against the tide, their next generation is gone. It is a matter of life and death. And that's why you and I, for the sake of our families, for the sake of God's name, with his hope, with his strength, with the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, you and I need to go against the tide. And what you and I are up against is more than just a raging river. What we're up against is this. It is a mammoth tsunami that you and I, in our own strength, are powerless against. The tsunami of temptation, of the corruption of this world, of ungodly influence, and again, even the deceitfulness of our own hearts, and of course, the onslaught of the enemy of our soul. And so to face this tsunami and to go against this tide, you and I need the Word of God, the living Word of God, that's Jesus. Because only Jesus can tell the wind and the waves, what did he tell them? Be still. And they were. And so that's why it's so important for us to make sure that we anchor our families in Christ. You see, nowadays, all the more, although it's nothing really new, but it's much more emphasized now. This is the attitude that, you know, if your family is toxic, if they're not supportive of you, if you think they don't understand you, if they, you think they're getting in, in the way of your life's objectives, cancel them. Leave them. Anyway, it's only a family name. The most important person in your life is you your objectives, your dreams, your pleasure, your happiness. So walk out on your family. It's okay. They're just like any other person anyway. Don't let them stand in your way. That's a popular way of thinking that is finding its way into a popular way of living nowadays, more than ever before. So let me ask you, what could be the greatest threat to the family today. Oh, we heard a lot last week from Pastor Marty, right? Distractions, uh, delusions, deceptions, and all of these things. But I would like to submit to you, it is entirely possible, and I think extremely probable, that the greatest threat to the family today is not from the outside. And if it's not from the outside, where is it from? Oh, there's only two sides, outside, <laughs> inside. I believe, based on God's word, that probably the greatest threat to the family is something from the inside of each one of us. And what is that? Okay. Do you recognize this movie scene? I know this group here will recognize it again. It's from the Ten Commandments. This is the scene where they fashioned the golden calf and began to worship it as an idol. And the reason why I'm putting this up on the screen is because I believe 
the greatest threat to the family today is idolatry. And I'm not even saying idolatry of money or pleasure. I'm talking idolatry of self. I, me, mine. By the way, how many of you remember the Beatles? The Beatles, not the insect, the Beatles, the band? You remember them? Do you know that they have a song entitled, I, Me, Mine? You can Google it after the service. But you see, it's really nothing new. I, Me, Mine. The idolatry of self is the most dangerous form of idolatry. And I believe it is probably the greatest threat to the family. The threat is inside. The external threats are just taking advantage of the fact that there is a problem on the inside. When did this idolatry of self begin? Did it begin with the millennials? Did it begin with generation, whatever it is? No, I'll show you where it started. It started way back in the garden. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What was Satan trying to say to Eve and by extension to Adam? And why is this still the greatest temptation today, this idolatry of self? Well, if you look at what Satan was saying, he's basically saying, um, you cannot trust God. God is not telling you the truth, at least not all the time. God is selfish. God is insecure. He doesn't want you to be the best version of yourself. He wants to tell you what to do all the time, what you can do, what you cannot do. God is a killjoy. That is what the serpent was trying to communicate. But more than that, look at what he said. Your eyes will be open if you don't follow what God says. Your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. What does that mean? It means, listen guy, listen girl, you know what is best for you. You can decide. You are the best person to decide what is good and what is bad for you. Don't let anybody else tell you different. Don't let anybody else dictate on your life, especially not God. And when you can determine for yourself what is good and evil, what is good for you, what is bad for you, guess what the conclusion is? Who needs God? Isn't that the logical conclusion? Who needs God? So you live life for yourself. Be your own God. And you know what kind of life that manifests into? The life of my. My what? My life. Anybody in this room remember Billy Joel? Billy Jew, one of his most famous songs, My Life. I don't care what you say anymore. This is my life. Go ahead with your own life. Leave me alone. That was the chorus of his song. Nothing new. Same thing today. It's my life. I want to do things my way. Give me my space. I will determine my identity, whether that has to do with gender or something else. May perhaps my identity is derived from my achievements. My pleasure is my highest priority. I just want to be happy. What about my money? Have you heard about the husband and wife? They're both working. And the wife tells the husband, my money is my money. Your money. Oh, you know, huh? You had that conversation before. Okay. My relationships. Don't tell me who I can have a relationship with and who I cannot because I determine my morality. And I determine my morality because I determine my own truth. Don't tell me to believe in your truth. You need to not only respect my truth, you need to accept my truth. Otherwise, you are intolerant. But you know what? Do you know how deadly this kind of life is? This self-idolatry? Because when these things 
When people pursue all of this, my, 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 and things begin to crumble, and they reach points of deep disappointment, then they decide, it's time for my death. It's my life. I will live it the way I want. I will take it when I want. My friend, if you're here in this room today, or if you're watching online, and you are toying with these thoughts, that you're so disappointed with life, you might as well end it. Can I tell you from the bottom of my heart, based on the Word of God, this is not the life God wants for you. God loves you. He has an amazing plan and you, your imagination cannot even begin to think of how amazing that plan is. So if ever you're toying with that thought, my friend, wherever you are, if you're watching this video, don't turn it off. And if you're in this room, don't tune out. Let God speak to you. Last Sunday, Pastor Marty told us about building a strong family. What is a strong family? A family that's founded on God's truth, a family that applies God's truth, and a family that makes God's truth known. Why in the world should I even bother to take steps to build a strong family, especially in the light of all of the issues in my family that I may be facing today? Again, we go back. God's original design for family is to be a blessing, not a battleground, but a blessing, a blessing within and a blessing to others. And so today's message, why should we build a strong family? Today's message is make your family a blessing. Tell the person next to you, make your family a blessing. Encourage them, say, yeah, our family can be a blessing. It may look like that's a million miles away. But who knows how much closer you'll get to that once God speaks to all of us. So this message applies to not just, you know, fathers or parents. Uh, who are the spouses and parents in the house today? Can I see your hands? Spouses and parents in the house, okay, we praise God for you. This message is for you because you can make a positive impact on your fellow spouse and on your children. Uh, who among here are children? <laughs> uh, if you're not raising your hand, that means that you dropped out of the sky. Okay, so again, who are children in this room? Okay, everybody. Every, so that means you can make an impact on your parents, your siblings, relatives, whoever, whoever is still living within your family, and finally, all followers of Jesus. When you are making disciples, whether in your family unit or among fellow men, fellow women, whatever it is, that is your spiritual family. And you and I need to make a positive impact on that family as well. So earlier we read a passage about the Rechabites. Remember? The passage from Jeremiah 35. So can I ask you, how many of you have actually heard about the Rechabites? You've heard the names before. Okay, I think more of you know the Von Trapp family, the Corleone family, and the Incredible family, but the Rechabite family, not so much, right? Well, what can we learn from this family? We'll learn a few principles and then we'll put it all together at the end. How to make our family a blessing based on the experience of the Rechabites. First is identity, the principle of identity. We're going to find out who were they and what can we learn from their sense of identity? Second is integrity. Why were they so different? And what can we learn from them that we can apply today? Inheritance, the legacy that they left behind, not only for their own generations, but even for you and me today. What did God have to say about them? And finally, putting it all together, integration, how can we apply these principles so our families can be a blessing? So let's begin with the first one, identity. What can we learn from them? First, uh, verse 1, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, go to the house of the Rechabites and speak to them, bring them into the house of the Lord, 
into one of the chambers and give them wine to drink. Jeremiah was an Old Testament prophet and uh, the Lord had him do a lot of strange things in his lifetime. All of them were object lessons to uh, prove a point to the Israelites. He was ministering during a time when uh, the, the Israelites, particularly the southern kingdom of Judah, were precariously close to being invaded, taken over, and eventually exiled uh, by the Babylonians. Now, here, in this particular case, in chapter 35, God told Jeremiah, you go round up these people called the Rechabites, and you bring them into a bar. No, he didn't say bring them to a bar. He said bring them into the house of the Lord, right? Into one of the chambers and give them wine to drink. It's almost like saying, you know, this is here one family, bring them into the, the backstage room and then give them wine to drink. So that was the command of the Lord. Then it says, Jeremiah speaking now. Then I took Jaazaniah, the son of Jeremiah. This is a different Jeremiah. Apparently it's a popular name, okay? So I took Jaazaniah, Jaazaniah, the current uh, head of the Rechabite clan, a son of Jeremiah, son of Habasiniah and his brothers and all his sons and the whole house of the Rechabites. And I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Igdaliah, the man of God, which was near the chamber of the officials, which was above the chamber of Maaseiah, the son of Shalom, the doorkeeper. Okay, first lesson, all of these names, right? First lesson is, be careful what you name your children. Don't give them a hard time. Name them John or Jim, you know? I mean, have a heart, okay? I mean, writing out their test paper. Uh, okay, time's up. Mom, wait, I'm just writing my name. No, I'm just joking. But here, Jazz and I, as I said, was the current head of the Rechabite clan. And I'll explain to you later where this clan came from. Okay, so he brings them now into the house of the Lord and he tells them, drink wine. And I said before the men of the house of the Rechabites, pitchers full of wine and cups, and I said to them, bottoms up. Take your pick. Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, with blue cheese or sharp cheddar or manchego or brie or camembert. Almonds, walnuts, are you hungry? What did they say? But they said, we will not drink wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us saying, you shall not drink wine, you or your sons forever. Okay, Jonadab is an ancestor. Rechab is an ancestor of the ancestor. Now, when you see the word, especially in the Old Testament, when you see things like son or father, it doesn't always mean like one line up or one line down. It's, it could be like great-grandfather, great-grandson. The point is they're all from the same family line. So here is the whole, you know, like a chorus, all of the Rechabites saying with one voice, one conviction, we will not drink wine because our ancestor, Jonadab, who is an ancestor of Rechab, and that's why we're called the Rechabites, our father commanded us saying, you shall not drink wine, you or your sons. How long? Is that a long time? Duh. Of you know, it's like when you set the birthday reminder on your phone. Oh, April's birthday is on May 22. So a reminder yearly, how long? Forever. Isn't that what you do with your phone? Now, does your phone last forever? Of course not. So it's kind of funny, right? You write forever on your phone. You know your phone's not going to last forever. But here they said, you know, they, our father, Jonadab, or son of Rechab, our father, he said, you shall not drink wine forever. Forever. Who were these people? Okay, let's find out. Who were the Rechabites? They were not Israelites, so they were not from the 12 tribes of Israel, but they were assimilated among them eventually, soon enough. Why? One reason is Rechab, a 
Kenite, so he's under that bigger clan, not again, again, not, not from Israel, but related to the Midianites. Now, who were the Midianites? Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, was the priest of Midian. So in other words, the Rechabites, or the Kenites, including the Rechabites, they were assimilated among the Israelites because somehow they were related to Moses by marriage. So there came to be a, a, a relationship among them. Now these guys were nomads or tent dwellers, or as we say in the Philippines, NPA. What's NPA? No permanent address. The most important thing about them is that they adhered to a lifestyle from one generation to the next that went against the tide, starting with Jonadab. Now, where did Jonadab get the idea? We don't really know much about the Rechabites. We, so, we know so little about them. Who gave Jonadab the idea? We're not sure. But the point is, we're learning now the principle of identity, right? So, the question now to us is this. Where should we and our families anchor our identity? And my best suggestion is we follow the example of Jesus. Luke 2, 49. He said to them, who's them? His mother and father. He told them, why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Jesus identified so closely. He always talked about his connection with his father. He said, I have not come to do my will, but the will of my father who is in heaven. He said, I and the father are one. He says, my father is always working, therefore I'm always also working. And guess what? Jesus, his connection with his heavenly father. When we give our lives to Jesus, what happens? His father becomes our Father. I know that's like so simple, but have you ever thought about how incredible that is? That our Father, that Jesus' Father is also our Father? How awesome is that? I mean, when we give our lives to Jesus, we become part of the ultimate incredible family. Why do I say that? Look at the amplified version of 1 John 3.1. See what an incredible quality of love the Father has shown to us that we would be permitted to be named and called and counted the children of God, and so we are. Are you happy that God is your Father? How happy are you that God is your Father? Yes, let Him know how happy we are, how blessed, how humbling it is that we find our identity in Christ. What are the implications when we anchor our identity in Christ? What does that mean? Let me just show you a few things. Let's do this. A little bit more audience participation. You guys up in the balcony, you ready for this as well as down here? Okay, what I'll do is I will mention the scripture reference and you need to shout out what it means in terms of finding our identity in Christ, okay? Example, trial, John 1, 12. Okay, we're gonna do better than that. That was just a sample. So now we begin. John 1, 12. 1 Corinthians 6, 20. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Ephesians 1, 4, 5, 7. Colossians 2.10, Romans 8.38-39, and now the last one, Ephesians 2.10. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad your identity is in Christ? Do you sometimes see this sticker on the back of people's cars? Sometimes they have names, right? Even the dog and the cat. Let me tell you an actual story, a person from CCF who had a very dark past, but God touched his life. 
He became a blessing to his family, and now his family is a blessing to many others. Let's call him Mel, okay? Let's call him Mel. Mel, as a teenager, was the black sheep of his family. His father died when he was young, and so he grew up in the company of his uncles and their friends who would take him to bars, and his life was all about bars, booze, women, smuggling, gambling, you know, the works. And so his life was so corrupted at a very early age. And then he got married, but he didn't change his lifestyle, so obviously there was chaos in the house. He would abuse his wife physically and verbally. Eventually, he left her. But you know what? One day, Mel's cousin invited him to church. And he heard the word of God. And the Spirit of God convicted Mel. And that day, amazingly, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And miracle after miracle started to take place. No more cursing, no more worldly lifestyle. Goes home to his wife, apologizes, they reconcile. Apologizes to his children, they reconcile. He begins to have a... <clears throat> a, a fiery hunger for the Word of God, to study it, to apply it in his life, and to teach it to his family. So he begins to disciple his wife and his children. And then, during the pandemic, he said, Lord, what more can we do as a family? And so he begins to reach out to his brothers, to their spouses, to his mother, to his mother-in-law, to their other relatives, and he begins to disciple and bless all of these people. Can a family be a blessing? Is there hope for the family? <laughs> if God can do that with Mel and his family, he can do it with yours and with mine. But we first need to anchor our identity in Christ. Let's now move to integrity. Integrity, what is that? Integrity is more than just honesty. Integrity is, well, if you're familiar with uh, your elementary math, the word integer. Remember integer? It means it's a whole number. There's no fraction. There's no, I don't know what butal is in English, but anyway, it's a whole number. Integrity means we are a whole person. We're the same person outside and inside. Outside the home, inside the home. We live a principle-centered life consistently. And of course, in our context, the principles we live by are based on God's principles. Okay. So, what made the Rechabites so different? They lived a principle-centered life. No duplicity. So, let's go back. They said, we will not drink wine, Jonadab, the son of Rechab. He said, you should not drink wine, you or your sons, meaning your descendants forever. But that's not the only thing. He said, you should not build a house, you should not sow seed, you should not plant a vineyard or own one, but in tents you shall dwell all your days that you may live many days in the land where you sojourn. So, um, observation. So it was not just about not drinking wine. There are a host of other things that Jonadab said that this family will live by. We will not own a house, we will not own land, we will not plant a vineyard, blah, blah, blah. Later on, we'll see the implication of what he was saying. But look at this. Part of what was passed on from one generation to the next of the Rechabites is this assurance that you may live many days in the land where you sojourn. Where in the world did they get that idea? You see, they were not Israelites. So technically, they were not entrusted with the Word of God. They were not entrusted. They were not among the original recipients of the Ten Commandments. See, part of the Ten Commandments says, you shall honor your father and your mother, that it may go well with you. You may live long in the land. Even the Apostle Paul echoes that command, saying it's the first command with a promise. Children, obey your parents. Where did they get this idea? Well, obviously, it was part of the effect of the assimilation into the Israelite nation. But the thing is, the Rechabites never forgot the promise that you may live many days in the land. Remember how many times we've said it in the last few weeks. Obedience brings blessing. blessing. They knew that. They knew that there is blessing in obedience. 
And so they said in verse 8, we have obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he commanded us not to drink wine all our days. And <laughs> ladies, you think you are not part of this, but look, our wives, our sons, or our daughters, no exception. And then he goes on to say, not nor to build ourselves house to dwell in. We do not have vineyard or field or seed. We have only uh, dwelt in tents. And we have obeyed and have done according to all that Jonadab, our father, commanded. What an amazing, uh, you know, family testimony. Now, some of you might be thinking, okay, so what, are, what is CCF teaching now? That we will not drink wine and that we will not buy houses and we will not buy land. Is that what CCF is teaching now? I'm walking out of this church if that's what you're teaching now. That is not the point. We're talking about principles. Like what? What principles from the Rechabites translated through the Word of God can we learn and apply in our own lives? Okay, I'll give you an example. So it's not about the wine, the houses, and the land. That is not the point. Let me show you what we can learn in terms of principles that apply today. 1 Corinthians 6.12 Paul said, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. So Paul is saying, you know, there are many things that we don't need to argue about. If it's okay with you, okay, it's not unbiblical necessarily, but I will not let anything master me. The only thing that will master me is God himself. So the principle is I will give God full control of my life by being filled with his Holy Spirit. Alcohol should not take control of you. That's very clear because the Bible says you should not get drunk with wine. But there are other things that can take control of our life. The things we think of, the things we read, the things we listen to, the people we spend time with. I've shared with you before I'm a movie kind of guy. So when I sit down and I put on Netflix and I see like there's this new movie and you know sometimes they say, you will love this. Have you seen Netflix say that to you? You will love this, it's like two thumbs up. It says number one in movies today. And I say, wow, what's the summary? Oh, no wonder they said I love this. Yeah, I wanna watch it. And then when I press the next button, it says 16 plus few things, substance, language, then it says sex nudity. Uh Uh-oh. But the plot is so good. You know, maybe I can just fast forward when it gets to those scenes. I will not be mastered by anything. So you know, by the grace of God, the moment I see that warning, okay, forget this movie. I'll just watch, uh, I don't know, Spongebob or something. So that's the principle. What other principle can we learn? First Chronicles 29, we are sojourners before you and tenants as all our forefathers were. Our days on earth, on the earth are like a shadow. So these guys lived in tents. Do we need to live in tents? No, it's okay to buy house or land. But what is the attitude, the principle behind it? The principle is, This world is not my home, so I will not be attached to anything in it. That's the principle. How many of you here are Filipino citizens? How many of you here are Filipinos of another country? Okay, we had some at the earlier service. Fine. Uh, Oh, (laughs) how many of you are senior citizens? Yee! Oh, You need somebody else to raise your hand? (laughs) Oh boy, okay. This is the best. How many of you are citizens of heaven? Hallelujah, look at all the hands in the room. Yes, citizens of heaven, the best citizenship in the universe. What attitude comes with being a citizen of heaven? This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. What other principles can we learn from the Rechabites? 
Okay, 1 John 2 tells us, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So this is black and white. Now the world here doesn't mean the environment. It means the evil influences of the world, right? So it's either you love God or you love the world. God says, you cannot two-time me. It's either me or the world. And then he says, in, uh, more specifically, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. This is uh, quite interesting. Uh, the word lust is common. We, we pretty know what it means. But in the original language, you know, the, the Bible was not written in English, right? And New Testament was in Greek. This word lust here, lust, for example, of the flesh, lust of the eyes. The word lust is where we get our English word epitome. The epitome. You've heard that word. Like you've used it before. So it's like saying uh, the be all and end all of my life. And so it's saying here, the lust of the flesh, it's like the be all and end all of my life is to satisfy my cravings. And that's not necessarily sexual. Anything that is part of our physical appetite, pleasure in all its forms. And then there's the lust of the eyes. I want what he wants. I want what she wants. And you know, when you look at the original meaning of the word lust, like I said, epitome, the, impl the implied meaning is this. It's an inordinate desire of things that are not good for us to begin with. That's the meaning. And it all finds its way at the root of this. The boastful, what is this? What's the middle letter of the word pride? So you see, that's really where the problem comes from. The principle is, I will love God instead of the things and ways of this world. And when it comes to loving God, you and I know, again, based on the lesson of the Rechabites, their integrity, is loving God, the bottom line is really obedience. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. The principle is, I will love God by obeying Him. Jesus said, says, do you love me? Remember he asked Peter that three times, do you love me? You know, Jesus said, if you love me, you will what? You will obey me. That's integrity. Living a principle-centered principle life according to the Word of God. At home, outside the home, anywhere we go. Are we good so far? Okay. So we talked about the principle of identity and integrity. Now we talk about inheritance. Inheritance, the legacy. What did these people leave behind? Not only to their next generations, but for you and me today. Now, you know, in a, in a funeral... Typically, when people uh, go up to give eulogies for the person who passed away, they almost always say good things, right? He was a wonderful man, gave to charity, was a, had a great sense of humor, blah, blah, blah. But sometimes there are people in the back of the room and they're saying something else. And they're saying, yeah, but he had two wives and three mistresses, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, there's this big question. What will people really say about you and me, about our life? But you know what's even more important? Here, inheritance. What did God have to say about them? What did God say about the Rechabites? That's what we're going to look at in a moment. You, you, you probably recall Pastor Peter quoting this uh, quite often. What you think about God is the most important thing about you. You've heard that before? What you think about God is the most important thing about you. I would like to add to that. Equally important is what God thinks of you. What does God have to say about you and about me? So let's find out what he had to say about the Rechabites. But before I do that, I want to show you a quotation from one of our leaders from North Edsa. His name is Adrian Camacho. And he told me that this is what he told his children. It's amazing. He told them, if I leave you with a relationship with God, I have succeeded. Meaning, as a father, as your father, I have succeeded. But if all I leave you with is a religion, I have failed. So that is his idea of inheritance. Sure, leave them a house, leave them some money, whatever it is. But that's the most important thing. I leave you with a relationship 
with God. So let's go back to the Rechabites. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will you not receive instruction by listening to my words, declares the Lord. So now God is saying, okay, let me stop talking about the Rechabites first. Let me now talk to you, the people of God. God is saying, will you not receive instruction by listening to my words? In other words, will you not listen to me? Why did God say that? Then he goes back to the Rechabites. This is what God said about them. The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, which he commanded his sons not to drink wine, are observed, meaning to say they are followed. So they do not drink wine to this day, for they have obeyed their father's command. But I have spoken to you. What did he say? Again and again. I, God, have spoken to you, my people, again and again, yet you have not listened to me. And then he goes on. Also I have sent to you all my servants, the prophets, sending them again and again, saying, turn now every man from his evil way and amend your deeds and do not go after other gods to worship them. Then you will dwell in the land which I have given to you and to your forefathers. This is the heart of God. He was telling his people, you know my desire for you? I just wanted to bless you. I wanted you to dwell in the land, meaning to enjoy this blessing which I have given to you and to your forefathers. That was my plan for your life. The problem is you're not listening to me. And it's not like God is kawawa or something. It's the people who don't listen. We will bear the brunt of that consequence. So it says, but you have not inclined your ear or listened to me. The, the phrase inclined your ear in the original language means to stretch, to stretch your ear. You, you know, like when we, when we can't hear so well and we put our, we cup our hand to our ear, right? And we say, what did you say? That's what God is saying. You didn't even bother to try to listen to what I was saying. He had this to say about the Rechabites. They listened to their earthly father. But you, my people, you say I'm your heavenly father. I have spoken to you again and again, but you did not listen. And you know, God is exactly right. Obviously, he's God. He said, when he says again and again, this is not just some idiomatic expression. If you look at the timeline of the Old Testament, right? If you look at the timeline of the Old Testament, and here's the time when uh, Jerusalem, Judah, was just about to be ravaged and eventually exiled by the Babylonians. Just before that, you see the prophets being piled on by God. One prophet after another, many times at the same time, warning the people of God about the impending doom because of their disobedience and their idolatry. So God said, I, I talked to you. I sent you my servants again and again, but you did not listen to me. What's the application? How many Sunday messages do we hear? How many small group meetings do we attend? How many Bible studies do we listen to? How many videos on YouTube about the Bible do we watch? But how much do we obey? Do we really listen and do what God says? Indeed, the sons of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, have observed the command of their father, which he commanded them. But this people has not listened to me. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I am bringing on Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the disaster that I have pronounced against them because I spoke to them, but they did not listen, and I have called them, but they did not answer. What a sad, sad story. So again, the question, what did God have to say about the Rechabites? They listened to their earthly father, their ancestor. What did God have to say about the Israelites? I am your father and yet you don't listen to me. Question, what will God say about us? So far, Making your family a blessing means 
As far as identity, it has to be anchored on Christ. As far as integrity, it has to be anchored on God's Word. And as far as inheritance, what we leave behind, what God will have to say about us, is it's anchored on pleasing God. Now, I'd like to call a brother of ours. His name is Anthony. And I want him to... Anthony? Yeah, come, come on over. Let's welcome him. Anthony Pilar. Anthony is 24? He's, 20, he's 24... Come on over here. He's 24 years old. Remember at the start of the message, I said, this message is for everybody. Because you're here, you and I are here listening to this, listening to God's word or listening online, you ask yourself, so this whole thing about family being a blessing, where does it start? Guess what? It starts with you and with me because we're here right now. So it doesn't need necessarily to be the father of the family or the parent or what. God can use anybody. If you're here and you're a, like in this case of Anthony, a 24-year-old young man, anyway, I'll let you he hear it from him. What did God do in his life? What was his, God, what was his life like before? What, how did God change him? How did God change his family? And how is God using his family to be a blessing? Would you like to hear? Okay, enough of me. Your turn. Good afternoon. Even in my youth, I look for satisfaction in worldly things. By second year high school, smoking became a habit because, because it made me feel like I belonged. Eventually, I got addicted to other things like alcohol, sex, and drugs. I caused a lot of trouble, bullying my classmates, making my teachers cry, smoking marijuana on campus, and cut classes. I flirted with different girls, joined a dance, dance troupe, and the basketball team because I wanted validation from other people. But nothing satisfied me. When I was in 11th grade, my advisor invited me to Elevate, which is CCF's youth ministry. I needed extra points in a certain subject and was told that my attendance would earn me those extra points. I told myself I'll never come back once I got what I needed. So on February 11, 2017, I attended Elevate and was ready to reject every word that came from God because I was not willing to change my ways. I mocked the preacher and distracted my classmates so that they wouldn't understand the message. But after the Elevate service, someone approached me and told me about Jesus. After I heard how much God loves me, it made me cry, it made me cry inside because I was amazed at how he sent Jesus to save me. I prayed that day to invite Jesus into my life. Soon after, I found myself unable to contain the love of Jesus in my heart. I thought of my family. How will, how will I share the gospel to my parents and to my four brothers? I being the middle child with no clear answer. I first started sharing Jesus with my classmates and they laughed at me right after the name Jesus would come out of my mouth. They thought I was joking but eventually, they saw how Jesus worked in my life. By God's grace, in a span of two months, I was able to share the gospel with all my classmates. In April 2017, I attended True Life Retreat and made a public commitment to follow Jesus. I also started to envision that in five years, I would be attending CCF with my parents and four brothers. I prayed to God constantly for my family. I would lay my hands on them and pray every single night for breakthrough for our family. I started to pray, care, and share with them and was able to first share the gospel with my youngest brother, whom I invited to elevate. Then one day, my mother suddenly told me that she wanted to attend the CCF service after watching videos online. By God's grace, she even joined a day group. It was October 2019 when my older brother, to the, the second to the eldest, and I had a motorcycle accident. We fractured our left forearms and my brother had a crushed spleen. The result of the accident led to the disqualification of his application to Philippine National Police. Our family was not ready for this challenge and financial burden, but the Lord saw us through. Two months after the accident, while recovering from an orthopedic surgery, I attended the CCF Intentional Discipleship Conference in January 2020. 
I was so blessed and my passion to serve even grew stronger. However, I received news that my fourth brother, next to the youngest, fractured his arm while playing basketball. I fell on my knees and in tears asked God what he was trying to teach us. I went home to my family and we encouraged each other that despite the challenges, God will never leave us. As God brought us through these refining moments, my mother was able to invite my father to attend a CCF service before he went abroad to work. Each time he returns to the Philippines, my father joins us for worship. We continue to pray for him and for his spiritual journey. I remember what I envisioned in True Life Retreat of attending CCF with my family in five years, but by God's grace, it happened in only two years. God really showed me Praise God. God really showed me how powerful prayer is. Today, through God's faithfulness, my mother is attending a D group and serving in the ushering ministry in our satellite. All my brothers are part of D groups. My eldest brother is now serving in the marketing team and my youngest brother in the documentation team. I on the other hand have heeded God's call to be a full-time campus missionary. <laughs> Praise God. And now serve as the youth coordinator of Elevate Robinson's Antipolo. God has given me the privilege to share Jesus and raise up leaders in one college, one university, and three high schools in Antipolo. I am also leading eight young men and four of them are leading their own small groups. Truly, regardless, Praise God. Truly, regardless of our past, Jesus can transform us to be a blessing to our families so that our families, in turn, can be a blessing to others. My name is Anthony Pilar. To God be all the glory. Hallelujah. Ladies and gentlemen, the Rechabites. <laughs> and in this particular case, John Adam was this guy, 24 years old, actually younger at that time, 17, 17 years old when God changed him and started to use him. Amazing. Shall we pray for this incredible family? Okay, let's pray for them. Father God, we want to thank you for Anthony, his mother, his brothers, his father who is away working. We pray, Lord, for their individual spiritual journeys. We pray, Lord, that with each day that passes, they will find greater and greater joy in just living for your pleasure and for your honor. We pray for his father who is far away. We pray, God, that you will continue to speak to him, to draw him to yourself, and to fill his heart with your Holy Spirit, his mind with the convictions of your word so that he can live salt and light where he is and of course rejoin his family in your perfect time that they may all dwell together as a family that honors you and worships you and obeys you. Father, we pray for each one, your protection upon them, their physical well-being, their, their mental well-being, their emotions, but above all, their spiritual life that more and more they will resemble your son Jesus so that they can bless each other more and bless more people through their family. We commit them now to you in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, amen and amen. Thank you so much, everyone. So we said, integration, how can we apply? To do that, well, first of all, I promise you this. I'll show you what, how many generations we're talking about. Jonadab, Jonadab lived around 800 plus plus BC. The one that they kept referring to, the one who started the whole idea, do not drink wine, blah, 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 blah. Their current clan head was Jazaniah. He lived, obviously, during Jeremiah's time, which was about 600 plus plus BC. So Bible commentators estimate the gap to be anywhere from 240, maybe 250 years. At least six generations. Imagine that. 
I'm sorry, but I don't even know the name of my great-grandfather. But these guys never forgot who their father was and what he told them. What about us? Will we ever forget who our father is and what he's told us to do? As we end, it says, Then Jeremiah said to the house of the Rechabites, Thus says the Lord of hosts. This is the blessing to them. The God of Israel, because you have obeyed the command of Jonadab your father, kept all his commands, and done according to all that he commanded you, therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not lack a man to stand before me or to serve before me. God says, I'm going to bless your family. That from this generation onward, of course, you keep doing your part, meaning the Rechabites. I will, you will always have people who will know me, love me, believe me, and serve me. How do we translate that now into our family situations? We need to go back to our anchor passage for this family series in Deuteronomy 6. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. How in the world do we apply that in our lives? I suggest to you very briefly, Words are to be on your heart. Remember we said it starts with you, it starts with me. Words on your heart means we need to study and apply the Bible personally and set an example. Every day. That's the meaning. Teach diligently. In the original language, this means two things. One is to whet the appetite. You heard Pastor Peter describe that two Sundays ago. Wetting the appetite. In other words, when we speak to our family members about Jesus, about the Bible, about God, let's not come on so hard on them. Let's, uh, let's not make it boring. Let's make it inspiring, exciting, humble, loving, and best of all, backed up by good personal example. The other meaning of teach diligently is to sharpen like knives. Folks, you and I need to be sharpened by the Word of God. And so we need to sharpen one another. We need, because we're going to have to cut through all of the garbage of this world. And you know, when knives are used again and again, they become dull. And so we need to sharpen each other on a regular basis. That's what it means to teach diligently. That's why it's on an ongoing basis. And then sit, walk, lie, and rise. This means grab every opportunity. Uh, one example I can give is when I visit my son's family abroad, and you know I like to go walking in, in the parks because it's free, and you enjoy God's creation. So I walk with some of my grandchildren. And so when we come to the park, I'll remind them, you know, hey guys, can you imagine? God created all of this grass, all of these trees, this park, so that you and I can enjoy it together for free today. How amazing is that? Or it says here, uh, hand and forehead. Apply it in our thoughts and in our actions. In our thoughts, our forehead, our hand, in our actions, what we do, how we think, how we make decisions. Very simple. I, I think I've shared this with you before. Uh, every purchase decision is a spiritual decision, okay? Even buying shoes. Example, a few weeks ago, I brought my grandson, my oldest one, he's 15. So I brought him to a shoe store. I wanted to buy him new rubber shoes. Now, I have a secret place. I have a secret place. Original rubber shoes marked down like you wouldn't believe. Okay, secret. Anyway, I brought him there. But I said, you know, the real secret is not the place. The real secret is we have to pray first. You ask God, does he have something in store for us? Just because something is on sale doesn't mean you should buy it. Right? Maybe you don't need it. It's stewardship, right? Even if it's cheap, you don't need it, don't buy it. But anyway, so I said, let's pray. Maybe God has something for you. So we prayed. We found this amazing pair of branded rubber shoes marked down like you wouldn't believe. 
So he was so happy. He had brand new rubber shoes, but more important is how we think and how we act, how we make decisions. Weeks later, I brought his dad with me, my son-in-law. Same, same secret place. So I said, son, I think you need new rubber shoes. This is the secret place where we found your son's shoes. Let's see if God has something in store for you. But we have to pray. So we pray, and then we go in, and lo and behold, he sees this pair of shoes, exactly his size, marked down like you wouldn't believe. And so we go home. He has a brand new pair of rubber shoes, but more importantly, what? A lesson. How we think, how we decide, how we act. Do you want to know where the secret place is? Secret. Okay. And doorposts of house gates, that means just create a God-centered environment. What does that mean? A few days, a couple of days ago, I was on the phone with my daughter. So we really try to inject God into the conversation. She told me a couple of days ago, Dad, you know, I really work hard. And which is true. She's really a hard worker, very dependable. But she says, I do not work for man. I said, oh, you mean Colossians 3.23? Do your work you know, with all of your heart for the Lord, not for men. Exactly. So, you know, bringing God into the conversation. I do video call with my son who lives abroad almost every night. And when we do that, we review the blessings of God in our lives, and then we end with prayer. It's just creating a God-centered environment. It's not as difficult as it may seem, but I know in some situations it can be very challenging. So at the end of the day, why should we make our families a blessing? And where does it begin? You see, God's greatest blessing came through families. What did God tell Abraham? And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And then his descendant, Isaac, did God say the same thing? Absolutely. And by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And then on his descendant, Jacob, and in you and in all your descendants shall all the families of the, of the earth be blessed. Were these perfect people? Were their families perfect families? Look at this guy, Jacob, the ultimate parent. In Tagalog, magulang. If you don't get the joke, never mind. <laughs> the greatest blessing of God came through families. What is God's greatest blessing? Or better, who? Of course, it's Jesus. And if you're here this afternoon and you want to be a blessing to your family, let God bless you first. Be blessed with a relationship with Jesus. Give him your life. Whoever you are, even watching online. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. So that if you should believe in him today, you shall not perish, but you shall have everlasting life. You will have a transformed life. You will have a fulfilled, purposeful life. Not problem free, but walking with Jesus as your savior, your Lord, and your shepherd. Shall we bow our heads together? And if you are that person who needs to take that very first step so that you can be a blessing to your family, let God touch your life right now. Let him into your heart, into your life. Let Jesus be your Lord and Savior. Tell him, Lord Jesus, I am so in need of you. My greatest desire now is to experience that new life in you, Lord Jesus. And so I open my heart, I give you my life, and I ask you to take full control of me. I belong to you now 100%. Will you show me what it means to live for you, to please you, to obey you, to live a new life with you dwelling within me? I want to be a blessing. I want to bless your name first, Jesus, through my new life and I want to be a blessing to my family and that they can know you and that they can be a blessing to others but Lord it begins with me I need you right now 
Dear Father, we thank you that we are your children. And we thank you that we have both the obligation and the privilege of being blessings to our families, that our families can be blessings to others. And Lord, we pray, help us to listen to you and to obey. To be just like the Rechabites, but this time, people who identify with you as our Heavenly Father, who listen to you and obey everything you tell us to do. That indeed our lives may be pleasing in your sight and a blessing to those around us. We give you honor, praise, and glory in the name of Jesus and all your people say, Amen and Amen. Good day, CCF family. Welcome to Sunday Fast Track, where you ask real-life questions and we give you biblical truths. I'm James Reyes from Exalt Worship Ministry, and we're here today with our speaker, Pastor Ricky Sartu, to answer some of your questions. Hi, Pastor Ricky. Hi, James. Praise God for your message. All glory to God. Here's our first question. Okay. How does one deal with parents who are often critical, leading their children to doubt their self-worth? What should be the biblical response when current society suggests that children should distance themselves from their parents for the sake of their mental well-being? Okay, that is a, a compound question, mm -hmm. right? So several factors in one. So let me first make an assumption. I'll make an assumption that the one asking this question is a, a Christian child. The first thing I want to say is that if your parents are overly critical and it's affecting your sense of worth, you as a Christian need to go back to the true source of your worth. And that's who you are in Jesus, your identity in Christ. And so you need to saturate your mind. You need to remind yourself. You need the Holy Spirit to just uh, lift up your spirit to remind you of who you really are. And that these things that come from your parents, uh, many of them may not be true. Now, hang on. You also need to pray to God for wisdom. Because maybe in between the lines of what some of the things your parents are saying, I mean, they, there could be a grain of truth. And so you also ask God, Lord, how can I improve? Because maybe you're also telling me something through my parents. Now, the thing about how should we respond, because society says, if your parents are toxic or something, just distance yourself. So you pray for wisdom. That's what I'd say. Pray for God's wisdom. Uh, ask your small group leader. If you're not a part of a small group, you join one and ask your small group leader or your CCF pastor. Tell him the situation. Ask him uh, what he thinks uh, God may be telling you to do. Now, in extreme cases, if it is really necessary, not just for your mental, but for your physical safety, to distance yourself, first of all, it should be on a very temporary basis. Secondly, is it should always be with the intent of continuing to reach out, not break the relationship, and of course, with the ultimate intent of reconciling and influencing your family for God. Okay, so don't make what the world says an excuse to cancel your family and leave them and say, I'm gonna live my own life my way and forget about the family because God created your family with you in it to be a blessing. Here's our next question. Okay. How can one honor their parents who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, yet if they are teaching them to do something that goes against godly teachings? Remember our mission in CCF. The one that's before make Christ commit the followers, it says to honor God. The best way we can honor our parents is to honor God first. If our parents are telling us to do something, that is not against the Bible, we honor our parents by obeying them. If our parents are telling us to do something against the Word of God, then we honor God first. And in so doing, indirectly, we also honor our parents by showing them what it means to obey God rather than people. But again, when we do that, we need to show them in a very respectful and humble way why we cannot do what they're telling us to do. We need to tell them that, Mom, Dad, I love you. Uh, I want to please you. I want to be a good son, a good daughter. But what you're telling me is against what God says. And with all humility, I need to tell you, I cannot do that. How they react is not in your hands. That is in God's hands. That's God's department. Thank you for that, Pastor. Here's our last question. There are parents who constantly fear that despite their efforts to disciple 
and lead their children to God's truth, they may not grow up in the fear of the Lord. How can the parents be aware of their godly parenting becoming an idol in their life? That is a very real fear. I know, because I'm not only a parent, but I'm a grandparent. So I think, and that's why one of my most ardent prayers is, Lord, I pray not only for my children, but for each of my grandchildren by name, that they will all love you, they will all know you, they will all serve you, even to the next and the next and the next generation until Jesus comes back. That's my prayer. We need to do what's within our influence or control, and whatever is beyond, we surrender to God. So we, we go back to Pastor Peter's uh, often said principle, MRI, modeling, build relationships, and be intentional. And we need to do our best to do that, represent Jesus to the members of our family, in this case, in the case of this question, to our children. Beyond that, how they will live that out, how they will catch that, that is the job of the Holy Spirit. When it seems like they're going off the rails, our part is to get on our knees and cry out to the Lord. But how do we know if it's becoming an idol? That was part of the question, mm -hmm. right? Yes. It's when we start to control things that only God can control. When we start to manipulate them, when we start to bear down on them, when we start to hit them over the head with our Bibles and things like that, those things will not work. As, as a matter of fact, they will do the opposite of what our objective is. So do what is within your influence in a humble and godly and loving way. The rest, again, is God's department. Praise God for that, Pastor. Uh, thank you for answering our questions. Sure. And what better way to strengthen our families than to know God's design for it? We invite you to join us at the Counterflow Family Conference 2024 with the theme, Refresh, happening this coming September 21. We have great speakers and surprises lined up for you. For more information and to get your tickets, visit counterflow.ph. And that's it for CCF Sunday Fast Track. God bless!